Uh, Anita has embraced the concepts and the goals of the Nature Conservancy and the Tall Grass Prairie Preserve. At the drop of a hat, she will share her knowledge with others. She enjoys her interaction with visitors to the visitor center at the preserve. It is said at times, if you give her the microphone, you may not get it back for two days. So, <laughs> set <settle> in late. <laughs> Anita joined the Tall Grass Prairie Preserve Dosen program after attending a recruiting meeting in Barnesville, Oklahoma. She is entering her ninth year with the program and currently serves as the program coordinator and new docent trainer. Anita is a retired oil and gas professional and worked in the industry for 40 years before retiring. Before setting off on her own, she graduated from Will Rogers High School and earned an undergraduate degree in accounting from the University of Hawaii. Oh. We won't hold that against her. She, she lives in a rural area of Osage County between Pawhuska and Winona with her husband, two dogs, and 14 chickens. With occasional visits from white-tailed deer, coyotes, and mountain lions. So we have a connection here with the chickens. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. We try to keep those apart. So, Anita, without further ado, we're uh, pleased for you to be here today. Thank you, Becky. I can bring some pictures um, from the preserve of some of the uh, historic buildings um, that I wanted to, to share with you. I must, I must tell you that this time of the year is very difficult for me because we close the visitor center on December 15th. And we don't open it again until March 1st. And if I don't have uh, the time to go up there, I must. <laughs> As my poor husband has to put up with me. <laughs> <clears throat> I would like to invite you all to one of our recruiting meetings. We will have one here in Tulsa, probably in late March. Uh, the DOSA program only requires three days a year uh, as a volunteer at the visitor center. So it's a pretty easy volunteer job. Let me get some glasses here so I can see what's going on. Yeah, she can't 
see with the lights out, so we might leave one light on. And I can turn that way. I've got it on the loop. Visits from Ben Affleck. 
I didn't even know who he was, you know. <laughs> He's younger than my, my youngest son. And I haven't, I haven't been to a movie since Steel Magnolias. So, <laughs> I, you know, I didn't know. After he left, I went out and looked at our uh, visitor signing on, and he wrote his name, Ben Affleck. But he, he said uh, he, his, his uh, residence was in Connecticut. And when, I was, uh, when he and I had a conversation, he told me he was in California. That should have been the flag that went up, but it didn't. <laughs> it didn't. So you just never know who's going to who's going to show up. You know, there's been a couple of movies uh, that have been filmed on the preserve in the last uh, few years. Uh, the recent one, which which has just come out, August in Osage County, was first a play. Uh, then it was a ballet, and now it's a movie. So uh, evidently, the uh, the story, you know, has persevered through all of those those formats. I'm anxious to see it. But living out where I do, it may be a year before the DVD comes out, and I can I can go buy it. <laughs> I, I, the the nearest movie house is about 30 miles away. So in. in uh, but that's just not something I would uh, drive 30 miles for. I'd rather go to the to the farm supply store uh, than I would a movie house if I'm going to drive 30 miles. Uh, let me just give you um, a little background, historical background uh, of the of the area. Uh, the Osage County came under the control of the federal government with the Louisiana Purchase in 1802. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and with it, in, the increasing intrusions from white settlers, which I would prefer to call European settlers, uh, because there were there were people from all over the world who moved west uh, to, uh, to settle those areas. Um, treaties with the United <coughs> States government uh, increasingly moved the Osage Nation until in 1825 they were assigned a 50 by 125 mile patch of land in southeastern Kansas. That was along the uh, southeastern border. Well, they still had conflicts with um, European settlers moving west. Uh, and they had already moved once to Kansas and the federal government was asking them to move again. But the federal government was um, ready to bond their lands. And so they purchased that land in southeastern Kansas from the Osage Nation and moved them into Osage County, what is now Osage County. Uh, the Osage Nation bought that land from the Cherokee Nation who had been moved into Oklahoma via the Trail of Tears. I think we're all familiar with that story. The government encouraged the Osage Nation, the Osage people, uh, to farm. But in Osage County, there's very little land that is tillable. Uh, the rock which holds the oil is so close to the surface that you can't run a plow through it. Uh, years ago, uh, a, a, a metal plow, when you put it through that land, there would be so much buildup on the plow that you would have to stop, knock all the mud, all the dirt off of it in order to uh, to to uh, uh, continue. Uh, 
uh, they first tried wooden wooden plows. Didn't work. I mean, you know, in five feet, uh, a, a wooden plow was uh, was unusable. So the metal plow made its uh, made its appearance. Uh, the Osage Nation were not an agrarian society. Uh, they were hunter gatherers, and so that federal program didn't work very well. But they were independently wealthy, and so you know they they received a um, uh, an allowance, if you will, um, about uh, each quarter of uh, from the uh, the trust that was set up from the. Uh, remainder of the proceeds uh, of their sale of land. So they were independently wealthy. They didn't need a job. <laughs> and uh, they could go buy whatever it was that they needed. Grazing leases are what brought cattle to Osage County. Osage County you know, Sage County, if you don't work on a, a, a ranch or work for the Osage Nation, you don't work. Uh, Osage County uh, has uh, an awful lot of cattle production. Grazing leases were a source of income for the Osage Nation also. That went into their treasury and the the quarterly payments were then made out of that. <coughs> when Oklahoma was looking at statehood, uh, they wondered, what are we going to do with Osage County? Because Osage County was owned by the Osage Nation. So what are we, what are we going to do about that? They negotiated with the uh, chiefs, if you will, um, uh, an allotment process, and uh, that became the uh, Osage allotment of 1906. And that allotment basically gave each, each Osage person, man, woman, and child, uh, a 640 acre. Uh, am I saying, I, I, this thing, uh, it gave each man, woman, and child. Now, can you imagine having a large family and each person in that family getting 640 acres of land? Uh, so, when they got through with the allotment process, they had a lot of land left over. And so that's when the Europeans moved in and either homesteaded or actually purchased land. Now, the, each man, woman, and child, of course, owned that land and could sell it as they wanted, needed to. Um, the area where the, the uh, Tallgrass Prairie Preserve headquarters is uh, was not a part of an Osage allotment. It was. Um, it was land which somebody didn't want, and so it uh, it was uh, it was homesteaded. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chapman and Mr. Barnard, who were Tulsa businessmen, uh, purchased the first cattle ranch in Osage County in 1915. Uh, between 1915 and about 1940. They had a, uh, the original purchase that they made was uh, 1,500 acres. Between 1915 and 1940, they had amassed about 125,000 acres owned and leased. It would take two days to ride from the west boundary to the east boundary. Uh, they were cattle producers. Uh, approximately 17,000 a year they would bring them in in April and send them out on the, on the railroad in August. Uh, 
uh, they, they did not run what we call a cow-calf operation where you keep your heifers in and their bread and you know you, the cycle goes on. They brought them in, fed them, put weight on them, and, uh, and uh, then sent them out in, in August. Uh, in, in, during World War II, there was more beef shipped from that area, from that, uh, that railhead that was on the preserve than there was from any place else in the United States. So that tells you Osage County is cattle country. Uh, Osage County, this part of Oklahoma was not really, you know, in, in movies and pictures we see, uh, we see pictures where the hills are just black with bison. Osage County, this part of Oklahoma was never, uh, we never had the numbers of bison that they did out west. So that's why the, the Native Americans would, would hunt is because here, uh, there weren't the numbers and they had to go hunt in order to feed the families. Uh, Mr. Chapman and Mr. Barnard uh, died within three years of each other in the 60s. Uh, they were gentlemen who had interests in oil and gas, uh, in banking, and many, many, many cattle ranches in Oklahoma and Texas. You know, the tall grass prairie preserve was called the Chapman Barnard Ranch. It was the largest in Oklahoma in its heyday. Uh, I can't imagine 125,000 acres. I, I sh as an oil and gas professional, I wouldn't want to plot that out. <laughs> So in 1989, the Barnard family, uh, not wanting to, uh, to ranch, uh, began to sell off those assets. Uh, and so the, the, nature, uh, the first offering was to the federal government to establish a national park. Well, as can happen with government entities, they could not get themselves together enough to do an appropriation for it. So it, after two years, it went back on what I call the open market. And that's when the Nature Conservancy purchased it, five million bucks, fair market value. Four years, they rested all the pastures. Uh, they mended so many miles of fence. Uh, it, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, and, and that's a daily job, uh, even now. We have five permanent cowboys there, and that's a daily job for them is to go out and uh, ride fence. So the first bison release was in 1993, uh, 300 animals, which was a gift from Ken Adams, who uh, was at that time associated with Phillips Petroleum Company. He had the ranch which adjoined to the north, and he dabbled in crossbreeding bison and cattle. We got our first uh, gift of 300 animals. They were released uh, in October of 1993, and the rest is just almost history, except we just, we just pay it forward, uh, so to speak. Um, our, um, we, we ran our animals up in November, and that is to count them. Uh, each one has an ear tag, which uh, has, a, it, it has an associating uh, data record that is scanned. Their record comes up, we know who they are, how old they are, and whether or not they're gonna to get to stay on the preserve another year, or whether they're gonna be sold. The animals are contained on about 24,500 acres, which means that basically for as many new calves as we have, we must sell as many older animals uh, because we don't supplement feed them. Uh, they're out there as they would be uh, 200 years ago. 
And so uh, we, we have to maintain about a 14 acre uh, grazing area for each animal. So we, uh, we, we call a herd by age and gender. Uh, the boys get to stay around until they're about six and then they have to go. They, they start to become aggressive at that age. Uh, that's when they start uh, stretching their, their wings. Uh, the girls can stay with us until about age 10 or 12. Uh, they become productive uh, at about age 2 and can have a calf every year after that uh, if they find somebody that they like. And now I must tell you that uh, about two years ago, I was coming home from doing a, uh, a shift at the visitor center, and I was on the road on the west side of the, uh, of the preserve, and it was during breeding season. I had stopped for 20 minutes because this one gentleman was really schmoozing a girl, and she just wasn't having any of it. <laughs> Finally, after about 20 minutes, now I don't know how long they've been there before I got there, but about 20 minutes uh, after I got there, she just finally said, I'm through with it, and she just took off running uh, over into the pasture. <laughs> but our, our, our breeding percentage each year is up around 70%. So uh, we, uh, we, our, our, our animals are healthy and uh, we don't have a gene problem. Uh, about five years ago, we did a project where we pulled tail hairs to do genetic uh, research on, and we do not have a gene problem. You know, it seems that when we don't interfere in nature, it happens, uh, and it happens without us. So that's kind of how we feel about the bison. If they're out there, and, and left to do exactly what they want to do, they do okay. They do okay. The the pictures you are seeing uh, on the um, on the wall are from the John Joseph Matthews cabin. Now John Joseph Matthews is a um, was an, an Osage tribal member, um, and he was he was an author an, an author and wrote several books about the plight of the Osage Nation in, in a white world. And he actually called us whites. Uh, he's buried, that's his grave marker, he is buried on the property. And this, uh, this is a storage shed, which I, you know, I, we can't find out who painted it, but I'd like to have that in my yard. The John Joseph Matthews property is under the management of the Nature Conservancy. The family doesn't quite know yet uh, whether they want to sell it to us or not. Uh, the two sisters in, in Mr. Matthews are now both deceased, and so you, you get that, that, that business of it, of it going to descendants and descendants of descendants and trying to get everybody together and to make a decision. We all know how that is in our own families. Uh, does anybody have any questions at this time? Becky? Uh, I would just like to know if it's self-sufficient. If you've got, you know, you're bringing in money for this, for the sale of the bison, uh, are you able to get by financially from that to be able to care for the 120,000 acres? Uh, we are self-sufficient. Um, the Conservancy was kind enough to set up an endowment and we operate totally within that endowment. Um, the sale of the bison each year, uh, although in, in recent years, uh, per pound, they, they are bringing more money, but they would never bring us enough money to operate on. Uh, the culling process is is how it would happen in nature if these guys were roaming, you know, 30, 40, a million, thousand acres, a million acres. 
uh, there would be a certain amount of calling, if you will. Um, there were before we tried to uh, eliminate them, and they came back, uh, thankfully, with the Chicago Zoo. Uh, but we, uh, we are totally self-sufficient. Now the animals, as I said, we, we allow 14 acres per animal for grazing. We burn three times a year to burn off all the dead material, uh, and that allows the, you know, the new grasses to come up. And it's, it, it would not be unusual to see bison in an area which was still smoldering uh, because they love the new grass, and, and that new grass within three days can be as much as two or three inches tall. And so they'll they'll be there right on it like you know like it was a, like it was a package of M and M's. Hmm. What other um, animals exist in this uh, ecosystem? We have a lot of white-tailed deer. Uh, it's not unusual to see them right in and around uh, the headquarters compound. Um, of course, many many species of turtles, coyotes, of course, those are our uh, garbage disposals, if you will. Um, we have badgers. Um, oh, I should have been more prepared to tell you. Prairie chickens are coming back. Uh, they were hunted to extinction in that area. Uh, there were, there were large hunts which were organized uh, to hunt prairie chickens. We have what we think is about 80 pair on the preserve. In Granola, which is northwest of the preserve, they're much more prevalent there. I don't know why they are, but they are. So they are coming back. Uh, we, we are hoping that the, uh, the proposed wind energy um, that is going to be built uh, over west of us, we hope that that does not disturb our prairie chicken resurgence because prairie chickens are uh, targets for larger predator birds such as eagles and hawks. And the eagles and hawks love to sit on those high um, uh, turbans and uh, and hunt, and a prairie chicken would be a, a, a really nice target for them. Yes. What is the water supply? Our largest water supply is Sand Creek. Sand Creek, yes, and um, it's it's very large. It has a very large watershed area, and uh, we have probably more than uh, 20 ponds on the preserve because the bison drink a lot of water. Uh, bison, when they graze, they are constantly moving. And um, uh, with that constant moving, movement like that and with eating uh, like that, they require a lot of water. Uh, a, an adult bison can drink as much as 40 gallons of water a day. So Sand Creek serves us very well. In the, in the drought years that we had, uh, we have our own fire department, which means we have our own water trucks. Uh, they would go out to the deep pools in, uh, in Sand Creek, and they would pump water into those, uh, those water, big old water tanks and go fill the ponds up for the bison. So you talk about self-sufficiently. Self-sufficient we were. Yes. You started out with 300 head. Is that the number you maintain all the time, or do you have more bison? We maintain a winter herd of approximately 21 to 2200. Now the summer herd numbers, which include the new calves, are normally around 2700, between 27 and 2800. Now the calves, of course, um, are are not grazing. They're uh, they're treating themselves to mother's milk, which is very very rich. They grow unbelievably fast. 
by September, October, you can't tell that they were just born the previous spring. Uh, they'll gain about double their, uh, their weight, their, their birth weight, uh, in about three months. How, how many people here have been to the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve? Oh, good. We yeah. have been representing. So after the meeting, uh, Anita is going to stay around for lunch today. And so people might be interested in volunteering for the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. And they might want to check with Anita to be a docent there. Three times a year is certainly doable for people. And you could carpool uh, if you can find a buddy. So, Willem? So, if you're interested, Anita will be around. And, and I would love to take your name. Uh, now, we do, we do have uh, in the old foreman's house, we have what we call a side room, which was used for uh, household help back in the day. Uh, you know, the maid or the housekeeper would come up with the family, and this was an area where she stayed. It has a sleeping area and it also has a bath. Uh, the kitchen inside the uh, foreman's house is, is uh, accessible for you. If you want to come up, say on a weekend, and stay overnight and do two shifts, you get you get sleep in the, in the historic foreman's house. Um, you have to be totally self-sufficient though because you know there's no quick trip down on the corner. <laughs> so anything you want you have to bring with you but the kitchen and laundry facility is uh, totally available to you if that is something that would uh, would interest you. I have never stayed in it, um, you know, because I go so close, I, I really don't need to. But we have several docents who come up from Tulsa and stay overnight, either Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, so uh, there is uh, there is that or would, that would be available to you if you wanted to come up and uh, and volunteer two days in a row. Uh, you would sleep basically with the wildlife. Uh, one of our docents uh, said she loves to throw the window open and listen to the deer. She said they'll come right outside the uh, right up outside the window, and you can hear them snort and talk to each other and, and so on. Oh gosh. So you would, uh, you would be right in the middle of nature. Of course, we have a lot of wild turkeys up there also, uh, which are, are visible. Um, and coming from the foreman's house, going down to the visitor center, uh, one day I counted 12 does, which were grazing uh, at one of the smaller structures that we have in the, uh, in the compound there. Um, they just lifted their heads and looked at me like, what are you doing? And uh, went about their business of, of grazing on that new green grass. So it is, it's, uh, it's a nature experience, uh, if, if that is of interest to anyone. Well, Anita, thank you so much for coming today and giving us a taste of...